Hi, and welcome back to Health Communication. Uh, we are about to do the third installment, wow, three, uh, of chapter 10. Um, I thought we might need a little bit of a change of scenery, and I really wanted to go home um, and be with, oh, recognize her again. Ada's here. Hi, Ada. Hey. She actually really wants dinner right now, so I'm going to have to make this. Oh, no, 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 no. I was just, I wasn't. Anyway, okay, well, um, she's got her pug pillow. Hopefully she'll be comfy. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm at home right now, and um, the good news is is that uh, unlike the rest of the things that we've been um, sort of cramming in the past couple of weeks, this summary lecture is only going to cover two theories, and they're sort of related. Uh, so hopefully um, you'll have a little bit more of a break this week while you're working on your next exam. Um, Okay, so let's get started. Um, just one important detail I want to tell you about is the first thing I want to talk about, which is called two-step flow theory, is not something that your book talks about, amazingly, because your book covers so much. Um, but it's a theory that I think is really instrumental to understanding any type of media effect, um, particularly campaign effects. So um, I wanted to talk about it for that reason, and it's also kind of lays the foundation for diffusion of innovations, which is what we're going to talk about next. Okay, so um, i got a little illustration here for you. I'm not good at okay. Oh, that's pretty good. Um, so this is a this is a, an illustration of the two-step flow model. What you see here is an illustration of the mass media, nice representation there in the rectangle, influencing some little nodes down there. You see a medium node, and then you see that node influencing uh, tinier nodes. Um, so essentially, the two the the two steps here is from the media to what we call opinion leaders. And then the next step is those opinion leaders influence um, other people in the public. Okay, so to break this down, essentially, the main tenet of two-step flow theory is trying to get at the fact that oftentimes, and I'm going to put this down right now, actually. So, um, the, the, the main tenet is oftentimes, um, actually quite often, more often, the media doesn't have a direct effect on people. So um, sometimes when we talk about like, oh, the media is telling people how to think, well, even if that's true, and I'm not going to get into that thing, but even if it's, if it's that simple and it's that true, we wouldn't expect to see the media having a direct influence and just putting a message out there and having it affect the public uniformly and directly. Um, more often what happens is, is somebody takes an idea from the media and then they talk about it with other people. They talk about it with their friends. They talk about it with their coworkers. Um, or uh, particularly relevant to two-step flow theory, they talk about it with people who are influential in their lives. Uh, opinion leaders, people who have a tendency to influence other people's opinions about things. Um, opinion leader could be uh, relative though. I mean, it doesn't, there's not necessarily um, like, oh, that guy is an opinion leader and that guy is not because it could uh, vary in different contexts. Sometimes uh, some of the research on this has uh, looked at opinion leaders as just being people who tend to consume more media. Um, so they tend to be a little bit more knowledgeable about what's going on. And so people respect their opinion and view them as opinion leaders in their own decisions. Um, but other times this could be uh, people in a particular community who have some sort of influence because of um, their position. Uh, an example I can think of is um, I had a friend who worked for the CDC and um, he was working on a project trying to figure out actually a crisis communication project, trying to figure out what the best way to get messages out to the public would be if um, some sort of a major flu hit, okay? Um, and again, another example from my Atlanta time. Um, I, this was in Atlanta, and they there were a lot of mega churches in Atlanta, like, you know, these huge churches that have 5,000, 10,000 people that come on a daily basis. And um, part of his research was actually trying to figure out how he could use ministers of mega churches as opinion leaders so that if they wanted to send a message out to the ministers hopefully the ministers would then share that with their congregants and um, not just share it with a lot of people I mean that's part of it right because they have uh, they have access to a lot of um, people that they can talk to about whatever procedures are recommended but I think more important and relevant to two-step flow theory is that the assumption was is that these ministers were opinion leaders because people trusted them and would follow their advice and had a lot of credibility with this particular community. So um, again, they were working on trying to develop a campaign that would be p uh, specifically angled um, at reaching this particular opinion leader. But again, um, what an opinion leader is could vary in different communities. Um, okay, so just a, a quick summary on that. Two-step flow theory at its core, though, is, is really saying that the media um, sometimes can have the best effect if it goes through 
um, somebody else first. If um, if the media can reach opinion leaders and then opinion leaders can share it with people who would likely share their opinion. Okay. Um, another reason I wanted to talk about this, as I mentioned before, isn't just because I think it's super important to acknowledge the role of interpersonal communication um, and things like media effects and health campaigns, but also because the theory I want to talk to you about next, which is diffusion of innovations, was strongly, strongly um, influenced by two-step flow theory and um, draws on it a lot. Um, Diffusion of innovations is essentially um, an explanation of how new ideas, new technologies, uh, new innovations diffuse or spread throughout a society. How is it that um, we adopt new ideas and um, spread them to other people until, the, um, until that idea becomes commonplace or until everybody has that new technology? Um, to sort of illustrate this, uh, I have another... <laughs> Try to get it up here. Um, I have another illustration. Okay, so what this graph is showing actually is literally the diffusion, what it looks like if you want to um, illustrate it graphically. And you'll notice we're not talking about any particular diffusion, and that's because diffusion of innovation says that any um, any technology, any new idea that does diffuse throughout society is basically going to do so with the same pattern. And this is what it looks like. You can see that at the very beginning, if you look down on this uh, on the axis of um, penetration of the target market, it starts off really slow, where something's introduced maybe by an innovator, right? Think about like a new iPhone or something like that, and only like 2.5% of the people have it, and then you get some early adopters that want to spend a lot of money just because they're hip and whatever, okay, fine, but then you could look at early adopters kind of like opinion leaders. Once people see those early adopters looking all cool, there's this early majority where 40% of the population kind of jumps in and gets their, and again, iPhone or whatever. I, I actually keep thinking about it as it applies to Fitbit in like a health calm context. This is like a bracelet that tracks your movement and you can, you know, um, motivate yourself to walk more and uh, keep track of your sleep and stuff like that. Anyway, we can use that as an example later. Uh, but then um, the late majority, another 40% jumps in. And then basically you've got 90% of the population who have adopted this innovation. Um, and then finally where it slows out at the very end, right? You don't have this exponential growth anymore. The laggards come in, the people who are kind of slow to adopt anything. Um, I, I I always think about the, the controversy, not controversy, the, the um, do you remember when uh, several years ago, uh, people who still had antennas on their TV were forced to get rid of the antennas um, and, and move to some sort of like cable box. And I mean, that was a forced thing. Like the government really said like, okay, this isn't going to happen anymore, but here's how we're going to accommodate you if whatever. I mean, that was like the laggards of the laggards that still had the, the TV antennas on there, right? But now we see that like uh, the plug-in right, the mode of reception, I don't really know the technical term for it, for the television has, we're at complete saturation now, even the laggards have adopted it, that last 10%. Um, anyway, what's really neat about diffusion of innovations is that um, this does have a lot of implications for health communication, but um, Everett Rogers, the guy who invented this, he started looking at the adoption of seeds, uh, how farmers adopted a new technology, in this case, seeds, and, and there have been thousands of studies since then that sort of show that that S curve, you know, that shape of diffusion um, in, in an S maps on to the spread of all types of diffusions. Um, but importantly, uh, diffusion doesn't always happen. And so a lot of research on diffusion of innovations, including the stuff that Everett Rogers, the guy who um, came up with this, did, is focusing on well, what is it that makes some things diffuse and other things not? Like, what if some things get hung up on the early adopters and then they, they never diffuse, right? If you look at that S-curve, it's like, well, why, you know, why did this um, innovation, like, only get here or whatever and the other one didn't? So um, some of the, well, in a health comm context, actually, I can think of one of the things that Everett Rogers talks about in one of his papers is looking at... Um, there was some. There was an effort. I guess you could call it a campaign to try to get um, a uh, a community in another country to start boiling their water for sanitary reasons, and um, there was all sorts of planning and, and implementation on how we're going to get this message out and teach them how to boil their water um, and, and things like that. But it turns out that there was a stigma in that community around 
boiling water because it was associated with something that only people who were sick did, right? Um, sick people boiled their water, so nobody wanted to do it. And therefore, um, you know, Rogers writes about why that diffusion didn't really catch on, right? Like they wanted it to. Um, your book ends up, even though, you know, I, I'm so disappointed. I, it's such a cool theory, but... Um, your book only de dedicates like less than half a page to it on page 269. Um, but it does talk about, you know, ever since all this research has gone on, um, different uh, innovation attributes um, that need to be present in order for that diff diff diffusion to happen. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of them are intuitive, but um, it's nice that if you're trying to dissect it, why a campaign worked or why it didn't, I actually think it's very... Um, easy to go to these different attributes and try to figure out what didn't work and also kind of use it as a checklist to figure out if you want an idea to diffuse um, what you need to do. So the first one that they mention is relative advantage which is the health innovation must be perceived as an as an improvement over the previous idea. Um, assuming there is a previous idea sometimes you are introducing new stuff um, but if you're trying to get people let's say I saw a study you know another study about different types of sweeteners. If you're trying to convince people to not use refined sugar or, or not use um, even uh, artificial sweeteners and you want them to adopt something that more natural, right? You would have to convince them of that there's some benefit to that. Um, also compatibility. The health innovation must be consistent and assimilated into an individual's life. Um, I think actually that speaks to that stigma example I was telling you about. If people perceive this innovation as being something that's not going to go over well socially if they do it, right, then there would be low compatibility there. Kind of like the social norm stuff that we talked about with theory of reason action, actually. Um, complexity or simplicity. The health innovation must be simple to use or people will not adopt it. Huh. If they can't adopt it, right, if it's too complicated, if they have to go to the health food store to get the um, refined sugar, uh, no, no, sorry, okay. <laughs> to get the natural sugar that you want them to adopt, then that's not going to be helpful. Um, trial ability. This one seems kind of difficult, actually. A health campaign must be able to be experimented with as, as it's being considered for an option. People want to test drive things, you know. Um, so it, do you want to give, I mean, not to say that, is there a way for people to try out the Fitbit before they decide if they want to use it or not? Oh, look, I almost got to my daily go. Well, oh, you can't see it. Anyway, fine. Um, but I would even argue that um, if you want a campaign to uh, sort of satisfy this criteria, you know, that there's some trial ability, you should at least tell people how they can, like even if you can't offer a, a, an experience for them to test, to test drive something, um, to try something out on their own, you should explain to them how they could try it, right? Uh, where to find... Um, where to find the sweetener you're recommending, if that's what you're recommending, right? To give them the option of some sort of trial. And then um, observability. The extent to which an innovation is visible to others will help with adoption. And I do think this relates directly to two-step flow too, right? Um, if this is, if, if what you're recommending is something that other people are seeing their friends or opinion leaders do, um, then they're more likely to do it themselves, right? Again, also sort of an overlap with some of the stuff we've talked about uh, regarding social norms. Um, and again, I, I, I would also argue that even if you can't necessarily make everybody adopt something at once, which again, that S-curve would suggest that you can't, um, the one thing you could do if you're de de designing a message is to say, um, did you notice who has done it, right? To point out people who have, maybe celebrities, for instance, another type of opinion leader, uh, celebrities who have adopted this behavior to say, hey, look, I know you, ah, I totally got my goal. You see that? Nice. Uh, so maybe that they haven't actually, um, not everybody's adopted it, but oh, here's a visible example, somebody who has adopted it. So, um, okay, I think that's it. I think we're done with chapter 10. Finally, yay. Okay, uh, I'll see you next time. Bye.